stuff matters. Exploring the marvelous materials that shape our man-made world by Mark Miedonik. Audiobook, book excerpt. As I stood in a tree, bleeding from what would later be classified as a 13-centimeter stab wound, I wondered what to do. It was May 1985, and I had just jumped on to a London tube train as the door closed, shutting out my attacker. But not before he had slayed my back. The wound stung like a very bad paper cut, and I had no idea how serious it was. But being a schoolboy at the time, embarrassment overcame any sort of common sense. So instead of getting help, I decided that the best thing would be to sit down and go home, and so, bizarrely, that is what I did. To distract myself from the pain and the uneasy feeling of blood trickling down my back, I tried to work out what had just happened. My assailant had approached me on the platform, asking me for money. When he shook my head, he got uncomfortable close, looked at me intently, and told me he had a knife. A few specks of spit from his mouth landed on my glasses as he said this. I followed his gaze down to the pocket of his blue anorak. I had a gut feeling that it was just his index finger that was creating the pointed bulge, even if he did have a knife. It must be so small to fit in that pocket that there was no way it could do me much damage. I owned pen knives myself, and knew that such a knife would find it very hard to pierce the several layers that I was wearing. My leather jacket, of which I was very proud, my grey wool school blazer beneath it, my nylon v-neck sweater, my cotton white shirt with obligatory stripes school tie half knotted, and cotton vest. The plan formed quickly in my head. Keep him talking, and then push past him onto the train as the doors were closing. I could see the train arriving, and was sure he wouldn't have time to react. Funnily enough, I was right about one thing. He didn't have a knife. His weapon was a razor blade wrapped in tape. This tiny piece of steel, not much bigger than a postage stamp, had got through five layers of my clothes and then through the epidermis and dermis of my skin in one slash without any problem at all. When I saw that weapon in the police station later, I was mesmerized. I had seen razors before, of course, but now I realized that I didn't know them at all. I had just started shaving at that time, and had only seen them encased in friendly orange plastic in the form of a big safety razor. As the police quizzed me about the weapon, the table between us wobbled, and the razor blade sitting on it wobbled too. In doing so, it glinted in the fluorescent lights, and I saw clearly that its steel edge was still perfect, unaffected by its afternoon's work. Later, I remember having to fill in a form with my parents anxiously sitting next to me and wondering why I was hesitating. Perhaps I had forgotten my name and address? In truth, I started to fixate on the table at the top of the first page. I was pretty sure this was made of steel too. The seemingly mundane piece of silvery metal had neatly and precisely punched its way through the paper. I examined the back of the table. Its two ends were folded snugly against one another, holding the sheaf of papers together in a tight embrace. A jeweler could not have made a better job of it. Later, I found out that first stapler was handmade for King Louis the Fifteenth of France, with each staple inscribed with his insignia. Who would have thought the staplers of royal blood? I declared it exquisite and pointed it out to my parents, 
who looked at each other in a wearied way, thinking no doubt that I was having a nervous breakdown, which I suppose I was. Certainly, something very odd was going on. It was the birth of my obsession with materials, starting with the steel. I suddenly became ultra sensitive to its being present everywhere. I saw it in the tip of the ballpoint pen I was using to fill out the police form. It jangled at me from my dad's gearing while he waited, fidgeting. Later that day, it sheltered and took me home, covering the outside of our car in a layer no thicker than a postcard. Strangely, it felt that a steel mini, usually so noisy, was on its best behavior that day, materially apologizing for the stabbing instant. When we got home, I sat down next to my dad at the kitchen table, and we ate my mom's soup together in silence. Then I paused, realizing I even had a piece of steel in my mouth. I consciously sucked the stainless steel spoon I had been eating my soup with, then took it out and studied its bright, shiny appearance. So shiny that I could even see a distorted reflection of myself in it. What is this stuff? I said, waving the spoon at my dad. And why doesn't it taste of anything? I put it back in my mouth to check, and sucked it assiduously. Then, a million questions poured out. How is it that this one material does so much for us, and yet we hardly talk about it? It is an intimate character in our lives. We put it in our mouths, use it to get rid of unwanted hair, drive around in it. It is our most faithful friend. And yet, we hardly know what makes it tick. Why does a razor blade cut while a paperclip bends? Why are metals shiny? Why, for that matter, is glass transparent? Why does everyone seem to hate concrete but love diamond? And why is it that chocolate tastes so good? Why does any material look and behave the way it does? Since the stabbing incident, I spent the vast majority of my time obsessing about materials. I've studied material science at Oxford University. I've earned a PhD in jet engine alloys. And I've worked as a material scientist and engineer in some of the most advanced laboratories around the world. Along the way, my fascination with materials has continued to grow. And with it, my collection of extraordinary samples of them. These samples have now been incorporated into a vast library of materials, built together with my friends and colleagues, Zoe Laughlin and Martin Conry. Some are impossibly exotic, such as a piece of NASA aerogel, which being 99.8% air, resembles solid smoke. Some are radioactive, such as the uranium glass I found at the back of an antique shop in Australia. Some are small, but stupidly heavy, such as ingots of metal tungsten extracted painstakingly from the mineral wolframite. Some are utterly familiar, but of a hidden secret, such as a sample of self-healing concrete. Taken together, this library of more than a thousand materials represents the ingredients that built our world, from our homes to our clothes their machines, their art. The library is now located and maintained at the Institute of Making Witch as part of University College London. We could rebuild our civilization from the contents of this library and destroy it too. Yet, there is a much bigger library of materials containing millions of materials, the biggest ever known, and it is growing at an exponential rate the man-made world itself. Consider the photograph on page 14. It pictures me drinking tea on the roof of my flat. It is unremarkable in most ways, except that when you look carefully, it provides a catalogue of the stuff from which our whole civilization 
is made. This stuff is important. Take away the concrete, the glass, the textiles, the metal, and the other metals from the scene. And I am left naked, shivering in mid-air. We may like to think of ourselves as civilized, but that civilization is in large part bestowed by material wealth. Without this stuff, we would quickly be confronted by the same basic struggle for survival that animals are faced with. To some extent, then, what allows us to behave as humans are our clothes, our homes, our cities, our stuff, which we animate through our customs and language. The material world is not just a display of our technology and culture. It is part of us. We invented it. We made it, and in turn, it makes us who we are. The fundamental importance of materials to us is apparent in the names we have used to categorize the stages of civilization. The Stone Age, Bronze Age, and Iron Age, with each new era of human existence being brought about by a new material. Steel was the defining material of the Victorian era, allowing engineers to give full rein to their dreams of creating suspension bridges, railways, steam engines, and passenger liners. The great engineer is in Bard Kingdom, Brunel, who used it to transform the landscape and sow the seeds of modernism. The 20th century is often hailed as the age of silicon, after the breakthrough in materials, science that ushered in the silicon chip, and the information revolution. But this is to overlook the kaleidoscope of other new materials that also revolutionized modern living at that time. Architects took mass-produced sheet glass and combined it with structural steel to produce skyscrapers that invented a new type of city life. Product and fashion designers adopted plastics and transformed their homes in dress. Polymers were used to produce celluloid and ushered in the biggest change in visual culture for a thousand years, the cinema. The development of aluminum alloys and nickel super alloys enabled us to build jet engines and fly cheaply, thus accelerating the collision of cultures. Medical and dental ceramics allowed us to rebuild ourselves and redefine disability in aging. And, as the term plastic surgery implies, materials are often the key to new treatments used to repair our faculties or enhance our features. Gunther von Hagen's Body Worlds exhibitions also testify to the cultural influence of new biomaterials, inviting us to complete our physicality in both life and death. This book is for those who want to decipher the material world we have constructed and find out where these materials come from, how they work, and what they say about us. The materials themselves are often surprisingly obscure, despite being all around us. On first inspection, they really reveal their distinguishing features and often blend into the background of our lives. Most metals are shiny and gray. How many people can spot the difference between aluminum and steel? Woods are clearly different from each other, but how many people can say that? Why? Plastics are confusing. Who knows the difference between polythene and polypropylene? I have chosen as my starting point and inspiration for the contents of this book the photo of me on my roof. I have picked 10 materials found in that photo to tell the story of stuff. For each, I tried to uncover the desire that brought it into being and to go with the material science behind it. I marvel at our technological prowess in being able to make it, but most of all, I try to express why it matters.